Well, howdy y'all, and welcome to Old Hillbilly Horror Podcast. I've patrolled the vast expanse of Yellowstone National Park, a place of breathtaking beauty and tranquility. But lately, an eerie sense of foreboding had settled over the park, leaving everyone on edge. Reports of strange sightings and unsettling events flooded in, spreading like wildfire. Whispers of the Mothman had taken hold, fueled by stories shared on Reddit. As a park ranger named Ray, I prided myself on my rationality and level-headedness. I didn't easily succumb to stories of cryptids and supernatural beings. However, as the days went by and more sightings piled up, even my skepticism began to waver. The Mothman, according to the Reddit threads, was a winged creature associated with impending disasters. Its ominous presence often served as a harbinger of tragic events. I tried to dismiss it as nothing more than folklore, but the growing tension among the park staff hinted at a collective fear. One night, under the watchful gaze of a full moon, I embarked on my usual patrol. The air crackled with an electric energy, and a thick fog enveloped the trees, lending an eerie atmosphere to the park. I glanced around, my senses on high alert. And then I saw it. A silhouette emerged from the darkness, the unmistakable shape of a winged creature. Its eyes glowed with an otherworldly intensity. The Mothman. Adrenaline surged through my veins as I fumbled for my camera, desperate to capture evidence of this elusive creature. Before I could steady my trembling hands, the Mothman lunged at me. Its wings flapped with a thunderous roar, and I staggered backward, my heart pounding in my chest. It tackled me to the ground, but before I could react, it swiftly disentangled itself and took flight. Disappointment washed over me as I scrambled to my feet, my camera now a useless weight in my hands. I watched as the Mothman disappeared into the night, leaving me with a mixture of awe and frustration. The encounter had been brief, yet it confirmed the existence of this enigmatic cryptid. As the days turned into weeks, the park staff continued to report unusual occurrences. Mysterious accidents, unexplained phenomena, and an overwhelming sense of unease weighed heavily on our minds. The Mothman sightings had become more frequent, intensifying the sense of impending doom. I realized then that my skepticism had been shattered. The Mothman was no mere folklore. It was a part of Yellowstone's dark tapestry. I delved deeper into the Reddit threads, searching for answers, desperate to understand the cryptid's purpose and the impending disaster it seemed to foretell. In the end, despite my efforts, the catastrophic event that had been lurking on the horizon arrived. A violent earthquake shook the park, unleashing chaos and destruction. Buildings crumbled, trees splintered, and panic gripped both visitors and staff. As I surveyed the aftermath, I couldn't help but wonder if the Mothman had come to warn us, or if its presence had somehow triggered the calamity. The answers remained elusive, lost in the chaos that had engulfed Yellowstone. My family used to go huckleberry picking up in the mountains in the late 80s, early 90s. My family was up a mountain in Washington along with some extended family members picking away when they heard screaming out in the woods. Now my father has always, always been a hunter and has lived through and seen a lot, including facing death more than once. Well, he decided to go check it out and told the family to stay put. He grabs his 3006 and goes towards the, the screaming. After an hour or so, he walks back to the picking area, face completely white from what my siblings said. We're Asian hard-working kind, so white is not a color for us to easy produce on our skin because we're slightly tan. The only thing my father says is to pack up, we're leaving. That was it. No one said anything, everyone packed up and left. My father never mentioned what he saw or talked about it, and he and my family never went back there. We stopped picking completely. What I find scary is he still went out hunting deep in the woods, but never ever to that area and never allowed my brothers to go there as well. My people are shamanistic or animistic people, so he definitely saw something, just not sure what and what could ever make him that afraid. 
I vividly recall the time when my fishing partner and I embarked on a hike towards a small lake near Linton Lake. Little did we know that this expedition would thrust us into an extraordinary encounter. So as we made our way through the wilderness, our attention was drawn to a peculiar sight ahead, an animal feasting in a meadow, initially mistaken for a bear. Fueled by curiosity, we cautiously approached, our hearts pounding in anticipation. To our utter astonishment, the creature rose to its feet, turning to face us, revealing its immense stature a towering seven-foot-tall Bigfoot. Stunned and frozen in place, we stood at a distance of approximately 100 feet, locked in an intense gaze with this enigmatic being. Our minds raced, grappling with the uncertainty of the situation. We were at a loss for what to do next, caught in a surreal moment that defied explanation. Amidst the tension, a surge of panic coursed through my companion, prompting him to fumble in his jacket, reaching for the 22 caliber firearm he carried. Sensing the gravity of the situation, I intervened, my voice laced with urgency. Are you nuts? Don't even think about it. The gravity of the potential consequences hit us both, dissuading any thought of provoking this formidable creature. In response to the mounting tension, the Bigfoot effortlessly reached down, hoisting a deer carcass onto its massive shoulder. Without uttering a sound, it disappeared into the depths of the surrounding woods leaving us in awe of its raw power and agility. Overwhelmed by the encounter, fear gripped our hearts, propelling us to pivot on our heels and flee in the opposite direction. Our hurried footsteps echoed through the silent wilderness as we retraced our path, desperate to reach the sanctuary of our truck, yearning for the safety. I grew up deep in the mountains west of Asheville, North Carolina. Me and my friend liked to meet up and rough it overnight in the woods despite being really young. Like 11 years old to early teens, both our parents were mountain people types. I always carried my 22 caliber when we did this, mostly to kill any pheasants, rabbits, or other small game to bring home. Anyways, to the story, we had this place we called Grapevine Holler that we preferred to camp at and had even set up some permanent camping structures, including an elevated wooden platform about 20 ft off the ground in the trees we were sleeping on that night. John wakes me with a few soft nudges, and I start to roll around, and he's got his finger over his lips and points out in the woods where I see this dim floating light moving slowly perpendicular to us. My 22 caliber is hanging from a branch overhead, and I get it down, but as I'm doing it, I of course make noise, I go prone quick and watch as the light stops moving for a moment before it starts moving towards us. As it gets closer I can see that it's a man holding up an old gas lantern. Dude looks like he's straight out of Daniel Boone reenactments and has a double barrel hanging from his shoulder. At this point he's literally right under us and I'm not breathing as he kicks around through some of our junk we have laying around. He stares at the tree that we use to climb up to the canopy and walks under us where we can't see him. Seems like for five minutes he was right under us as we could see the lantern light, and I still feel like I haven't breathed at this point. The lantern goes out and he starts walking away back the way he came briskly. Me nor John moved or made a noise till morning. Whoever the hell he was, we both know to this day he knew we were in that tree. There were way too many climb marks on it from years of use for even someone with no tracking experience to notice. This was the kind of place where everyone knew everyone, and I never saw that man again. I was seven years old when one day I was walking towards the couch I decided to look up my steps as I walked by. I saw standing on the top of my steps a tall shadow figure. All I can see is an outline of its hat, which looked like a short top hat that Undertaker uses. Didn't watch wrestling at that time, I could even notice a long trench coat. I stared at him for a couple of seconds and he was gone. Then out of nowhere, he stretched his leg towards the other room. I went to check, I don't know why I wasn't scared at the time, entered the room where the shadow person went in and nothing. I remember when I walked down my steps, I noticed another shadow figured on my wall located by the steps. I went back to my room, grab a metal hanger, and went back to the shadow figured. 
It kind of looked like a mix of a pigeon and bat, but it was black almost looked like the alien symbiote that turned Spider-Man into Venom. So I decided to poke it with the metal hanger. As soon as I touched it, it dissipated like as if Thanos snapped his fingers. This will always be in the back of my mind. Maybe it was a dream or maybe I'm wishing it was. Deep down in my soul, I know what I saw was real. Last night at about 2 a.m., my dog started barking viscously. I have a German Shepherd. She's a guard dog. So I'm no stranger to aggressive barks. But this was the most intense behavior I had ever seen before. She was barking at the door, so my first thought was there's an intruder at the door. Again, I really have never heard her behave like that. I thought about getting a weapon. I was really scared someone might be at the door. But then I remembered that my cat was outside, so maybe it was my cat making a fuss. Even if it was an intruder, my dog would kill someone to protect me. I looked through our peephole, but no one was there, so I opened the door. My dog had been barking the whole time. When I opened the door, instead of going out to sniff around like she usually does, she planted herself in front of my and got even louder. She was guarding me. I have never seen anything like it from her. I looked out to see what it could be, and then I saw it. The first thing I noticed were the eyes. It was like when you shine a light on an animal's eyes, sort of glowing in the nighttime darkness. I then noticed the antlers and thought it must be a deer. But then I realized its face looked about nine feet above the ground. Then I noticed its body. I could make the outline and could tell it was fur, but it was standing in a human-like position, hunched over almost on its hind legs. I have never been so terrified as soon as I realized I was looking at something paranormal. I slammed the door and shut all of my windows, locked all the doors, and hid under the sheets like I was a little kid. I am still shaken up. I can't stop thinking about it. I haven't fallen asleep tonight because every time I close my eyes I see it. I'm curious what this creature was. I know the appearance of the Wendigo is debated and seems to be controversial. But I am still terrified by what I saw. If anyone has any information relative to my story, I would love some insight. Thanks to whoever believes me. One of my sons and I like to hike in the backwoods of Oregon and Washington states. Several years ago, we were on a backpacking trip during the middle of the week to several lakes on the shoulder of Mount Hood. Right at dusk, we had a super heavy something walk into our little hidden camp on two feet shaking the ground. It abruptly stopped just outside our little tent. Then there was a big whack sound from where it had walked in on us. We were zipped in the tent because it had begun to rain. We sat still because flight or fight had kicked in for both of us. We were waiting to see what the next move would be. We sat waiting for what might come next. Because of being in the woods backpacking for many years, we learned to have a cool head and evaluate what we might be up against. Then out of the deafening silence, there was an answering rock clap from the opposite side of the tent. We were now aware that we were dealing with two separate things right outside our tent. We sat waiting. Nothing. No noise. No brush or underbrush. No snuffling. Dead silence. We got out of the tent and saw nothing. Since there was only one way out of that camp, and the thing had walked in on the only path out, it was now fully dark, plus a few miles back to where our truck was parked. I made the decision to stick right there for the rest of the night. We would walk out in the morning. I rolled over and went to sleep. I know, strange, but I think the shock of it made me adapt with, and it is what it is at this point. My son laid awake most of the night expecting them to come back. They didn't. No smell. No noise beyond the two signals we heard coming from different directions. The creepiest part of the whole experience was the tranquil retreat. What animal arrives shaking the ground, sends and receives a signal, and then melts away without a sound. I was so glad my son was there with me on that trip. It is helpful to have someone who experienced it all too. Since the night that happened, my son will straight up tell you there is Sasquatch in the deep woods of Oregon. 
It was a super odd experience for sure. I live on 10 acres in Southern Oregon in the woods. I back up to BLM land that goes for miles. I am aware of what is out there beyond our door. I hope to never run into one here on our own ground. No, thank you. This is no joke for me. For context, I don't actually know if this is a Wendigo-related experience. It's just a possibility out of a thousand and due to my ignorance of the manner, I came here looking for answers. For context, this takes place at my grandfather's property in Walla Walla, Washington. It was an ordinary camping trip, and I had invited my two best friends from high school. Names don't matter, so I'll just call them Frank and Chris. It was getting late at night, and we wanted to kill time before the big campfire of the night. So as fearless teenagers do, we hit the trails. We walked for about one and a half miles away from camp on a straight trail until arriving in a patch of dead forest. Which was strange because it was the only patch of dead vegetation in a 12-mile radius around the property. So this puts us of edge, it's strange and eerie. Then all of a sudden we all get hit with a sense of suspense and anxiety, and as we look at each other for confirmation of sharing the same experience we hear a foghorn. Yet again we have no neighbors, and without communicating we all know to just run. We ran and ran driven by primal fear. The fear that you experience when you know you're the prey. We didn't stop till we were at the fire. I don't know what it was, but whatever it was I wasn't trying to find out. If anyone has an answer, please tell me. Mainly looking for the significance of the dead forest and the foghorn. When I was younger, my parents were stationed off the Queen Charlotte Islands in the Canadian Navy. They used to take me out with them on the boat and stuff when I was younger, so I saw tons of killer whales and all that neat stuff. My father and his Navy friends had a game when they were far out into the ocean where they would swim under their ship from one side to the other. It was uneventful and not that dangerous as the ships weren't massive warships. Anyways, one time they're all doing it. My dad goes under comes up laughing. A few people go. Then his friend goes. His friend comes up says nothing sits down white as a ghost. He explains that while he was under the boat he opened his eyes and saw an incredibly large shadowed figure moving directly under him. Not a whale or any kind of animal, and he was genuinely terrified. He spent his whole life on the ocean and has never seen anything close to what he saw. From then on I believe he was transferred inland as he had a strong phobia of deep dark water. I went camping about six months back with a couple friends up in Central Oregon. We ended up setting up camp near a trailhead for some creek I'd never heard of. It was public land and there was a dirt road, but it definitely wasn't a campground, no bathrooms, hookups, etc. And we were the only ones there besides a couple people hiking through during the day. As we were zipping up our sleeping bags, we all heard this strange metallic clanging sound off in the distance. I can't liken the sound to anything I've ever heard before. It was just kind of a dull, slow metallic clang. It went three times, then silence, then three times again about 20 seconds later. It came from the direction of the highway, so we just kind of assumed it was a vehicle or a road sign blowing in the breeze or something, and we went to bed. Well, whatever I had for lunch or dinner wasn't sitting right at all, and there was about to be trouble, so I woke up at around 3.30 in the morning. Even though it was pitch dark and creepy woods and all, I had just about resolved to pick up a flashlight and a roll of TP and do what one does in the woods when there is no toilet. And then suddenly I heard it again. Except it was louder and came from the exact opposite direction deeper into the forest. I noped so hard that I shook my tent mate awake and asked to borrow his car keys and drove 15 miles up the road to an actual campground with a nice safe illuminated bathroom. No idea what it was, but didn't want to find out, especially while pooping. On my first and final hunting trip, I saw a cryptid. So I was with a group of seasoned hunters, well versed in the ways of the wild. 
As we made our way deeper into the woods, we occasionally split up to cover more ground. Being the youngest member of the group, I ventured alone into the heart of the forest. They thought it would be funny for Rookie to go somewhere uncharted. Anyhow, the towering trees seemed to close in around me, casting elongated shadows that danced on the forest floor. It was during this solitary journey that I first caught sight of it. Out of nowhere I heard a weird screech and saw it. A large, dark figure emerging from the shadows, walking upright in my direction. My heart skipped a beat, and instinctively, I sought refuge behind the nearest tree. Trembling with a fear, I peeked around the trunk to catch another glimpse. To my astonishment, the unknown predator was mere feet away, its presence looming over me. The creature stood a bit shorter than me, yet its aura exuded an eerie power. Cloaked in darkness, it appeared black against the backdrop of the forest, its form blending seamlessly with the night. As I strained my eyes to discern more details, I noticed the absence of a visible neck, lending an uncanny aspect to its appearance. It paused by the tree I was hiding behind, its head tilted upward, sniffing the air with a nose that pointed skyward. I squinted intently, but there were no discernible eyes to be seen, shrouding this enigma in further mystery. Fear took hold of me, rendering me immobile. My muscles refused to respond, and I stood rooted to the spot, a helpless witness to this encounter with the unknown. My breaths came in shallow gasps, and my mind raced with a thousand thoughts, wondering what this creature was capable of. Just as abruptly as it had arrived, the mysterious creature turned around, moving away from me with an unsettling air of nonchalance. It walked with a casual gait, as if its encounter with me had been nothing more than a fleeting moment in its own enigmatic existence. In that frozen moment, I yearned for the safety of my rifle, the comfort of familiarity and firepower. But fear had gripped me so tightly that my hands remained empty and my instincts stifled. I could not bring myself to act, to defend myself against this unknown predator. Minutes felt like hours as I stood there, grappling with my own terror. Eventually, one of my fellow hunters stumbled upon me. He looked at me with concern etched on his face and asked why I appeared petrified. With a trembling voice, I recounted the haunting encounter, describing the large, dark figure and its presence. I mentioned the possibility of a dogman or even a Bigfoot. But instead of understanding or support, my revelation was met with mocking laughter and dismissive remarks. One by one, the hunters called an end to the hunt, their skepticism prevailing over my harrowing experience. They urged me to put my fears aside and join them in their retreat from the wilderness. Yet, deep within me, a flicker of uncertainty remained. The memory of that encounter refused to fade, and the question of what I had truly witnessed lingered in my mind after this encounter. I never went on a hunting trip again. This happened about five, seven years ago when I was 20 years old. My mother, who is a vet, owns a clinic at the edge of town. Although it's a big town with roughly 100,000 people, when I say edge of town, I mean there are cornfields stretching for more than 30 miles to the west and 5 miles to the north, with intermittent forestry in that area. On this particular day, I accompanied my mother to check on a dog that had been receiving extensive treatment overnight at the clinic. Additionally, there was a small pug weighing around 9-15 pounds that had stayed there overnight. I offered to take the pug outside to do his business, saving my mom one more chore. The back of the clinic faced a grass-covered pond or marsh, which dried up from time to time. The grass in that area was about 3-4 feet tall. I don't recall if it was late winter, early spring, or early fall, but there was no snow and the grass was tall so my guess is it was early fall. The front of the clinic faced a road and other commercial buildings, like a Menard store and some offices. However, the back of the building, as I mentioned earlier, was very undeveloped. Inside the clinic, there were some leftover cookies, and being a kid, I grabbed one and started munching on it while waiting for the pug to finish. I'm not particularly fond of sweets, so I got halfway through the cookie and decided I'd had enough. I recall the night having a vaguely eerie feeling, which is not uncommon in the Midwest. 
If you're from the Midwest, you'll understand what I mean. It was unusually quiet, even more so than usual. Typically, the pond is full of sounds frogs, insects, and the like. But as I mentioned, it wasn't summer or spring, so I brushed it off as well. Lost interest in my cookie, I decided to throw it into the grass, hoping small critters would enjoy it as a snack. I launched the half cookie into the grass, maybe 15 yards at most. I don't have a great arm, and it was only half a cookie, so it didn't go very far. It landed in a taller thicket of grass towards the east towards the Menard's store next door. From the west where there was nothing but undeveloped land, I suddenly heard and saw something roughly the size of a deer or a person taking off as soon as my cookie landed. It was heading straight for it. Now I know deer since I live in the country and I'm familiar with local wildlife. I know how deer move, but this thing moved like a person. It was as pale as paper and had no fur whatsoever. I could still see its spine pushing against its skin. There was no arch to its back, flat to arch like you would see in a quadrupedal animal pulling with its front legs. Instead, it moved like an ape or a person hunched over, its spine never straightening. It ran on two legs in an inhuman way. All I could see was the shiny, semi-reflective skin of its back, about two feet of it, stopping where its neck or shoulders should have started. It had no large shoulder blades like a deer, dog, or any quadruped. Instead, it had a narrow chest resembling that of a sight hound or a deer, but bipedal with ball and socket shoulders. Not to mention, deer don't run towards things you throw in the grass, they are skittish. The moment the cookie landed, both the dog and I froze. I had never been frozen by fear before but that's how I felt at that moment. We just watched it for two five seconds as it ran from one end of the grass to where my cookie had landed. Then it disappeared and I heard it running away from me. Once I couldn't hear it anymore, I immediately decided to go back inside. The dog, however, needed a small tug on the leash to convince him, but that was it. If you know small dogs, you'll know they are obnoxious and overly brave, barking at everything they don't know. But this dog never made a peep, and as soon as it realized I wanted to leave, it was in complete agreement. I am not one to believe in the paranormal or religion, but this was something I could never explain. I know what deer look like, and this thing was no albino, hairless deer. It was something else, and the Wendigo is all I can think of, with its emaciated body and pale white skin. I'm starting to think that the Native Americans had a reason for their stories. I can still remember that night in perfect detail, and it still raises the hair on the back of my neck. I was backpacking by myself for the first time along the Lake Superior hiking trail in Minnesota. On day two, my mind started to mess with me. On a part of the path that intersects with a snowmobiling trail, I found a nice, shady log to sit on and rest. I put my head on my backpack and closed my eyes for a bit. I wasn't sleeping, but I was actively daydreaming in a rest state. I don't remember anything, but at one point my own mind said, and I remember nothing. Instantly, I sat up straight, fully awake, and I could not recall a single thing I was daydreaming about. Sure, you don't remember your dreams or daydreams a lot, but it was so weird that my mind literally stated that it was forgetting something. Also, on the third day, which was my last day, I spent an hour in the dark marching through the trail just so I wouldn't have to set up camp so close to my car. Once I made it to my car, I changed, put my soaked hiking shoes on the trunk of my car to dry off and tried to pass out in my back seat. I don't remember if I was sleeping or not, but all of a sudden I remember thinking to myself, Mr. Chinchilla, you need to get your shoes from on top of the trunk. What if someone steals them? Immediately after that, I heard a voice that sounded eerily similar to my friend's voice. She said, But Mr. Chinchilla, you said you would leave them on the trunk. You should just continue to sleep. I replied out loud. But I need to get them. They're expensive. Getting out the car, I retrieved my shoes, enjoyed the amazing sky for a few minutes, and went back to my car and fell asleep. What was really weird about the second one was that I didn't hear the voice in my head, but I actually heard it. 
It was much different than what my head voice narrated. I didn't think much of it until the next morning. Albeit, these examples are not creepy and can probably be explained by seclusion and exhaustion. I just find it weird how your own mind can mess with you. I have other examples during the same hike, but these two are the most extreme. Back when I was like six, or maybe seven, thirty years ago, I was an unknown predator as a child. Lived in a trailer park, so during the summer, it was literally Lord of the Flies from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. One day, while me and a friend were snooping around people's yards, we found a rowboat behind a shed. The thing was rotted, falling apart, and just not fit for use. But my friend got all excited and said he knew where a lake was we could go sailing at. So we grabbed some skateboards and two-by-fours for oars and proceeded to stead the boat. It took four hours of dragging it, and another two hours of moving it though swamp and forest. But we get to the lake my friend was talking about. To us it was a lake, but really just a pond. We're excited about a job well done and just throw everything into the boat and start rowing out with the two by fours. We get out to the middle of the pond and we started to realize we're taking on water, lots of water and fast. We start to panic because we can't scoop out water faster. Then it's leaking in when suddenly we hear a hollow dunum and scratching sound. The boat was sitting on something and we were no longer sinking but still taking on water. We take off our shirts, socks and stuff them into spots we could see water leaking in and finally relax, we can get water out faster than it was coming in. It was then we had a chance to take in the surroundings. It was pretty awesome for a six-year-old and we're talking about six-year-old stuff for a few minutes and then I looked down into the water. It was really clear and seemed deep. And then I realized what I could see and what we were stuck on. In the pond, we could see hundreds of 50-gallon metal barrels. They were piled up so high in some places, the boat had gotten stuck on one of them. It was like looking into an alien world with mountains of barrels everywhere. I think I had just seen Return of the Living Dead, which starts with kids opening a 50-gallon barrel and releasing the undead I think so I was freaking out and tell my friend we need to get out fast. So we're panicking and getting water out of the boat, and then my friend screams and points down the road. And we both see something worse than undead zombies. The trailer park manager in his truck flying down a dirt road near the pond and coming right for us. Now it might not sound like much, but this was the guy who got you in serious trouble. Trailer park parents generally didn't care what the kids did, but when he shows up to your house to threaten your parents with being kicked out because of what your kid did, you knew you were in for a memorable beating. He pulled up near the pond and were trying to row away from him, but we were starting to sink again. He grabbed a rope and threw it out to us and pulled us in. We were terrified. We knew we were in for some serious screaming from him and beating from our parents. But he didn't scream, didn't threaten, he just stood there staring at us. He asked us what the hell we were doing out there, that we were trespassing, stealing, and what we were doing was wrong, but not screaming. He was calm, kind of scared, like we got him in trouble. We explained what we were doing there, but didn't bring up seeing the barrels. He questioned us forever, we were six and then told us he wouldn't tell our parents, which was crazy because he told parents everything he saw and would bring us home if we agreed to never go out there again and to not tell our parents. Otherwise, he would tell them about all the crimes we committed. He dropped us off back in the park and we never heard anything about it again. One thing that did change was he never was mean to the two of us again, but was a bastard to every other kid. He never told our parents about anything we did wrong and was never mean or threatening to myself or my friend again. My uncle saw a skinwalker. So as I said, this happened to my uncle when he was about my age. I'd say early 20s, maybe 18 or 19. Must have been the 70s in that case. He was out in the Wyoming wilderness tending to a ranch house. Just him and his girlfriend. The owner was out and had him go up to take care of the animals until he came back. A few days in, and everything was well. Animals well, uncle well. 
He decides to retire for the night, goes in the cabin with his girlfriend. Sun goes down, they pass out. Uncle wakes up to the pitch black and this horrific, hypnagogic scream. It was one of those things he later recalls that he hoped he had only dreamed. So he lays there for a bit. Things seem okay. Girlfriend doesn't stir. Tries to drift back off. But before he can another one comes, this time undeniably real. Girlfriend wakes and the dog started barking. My uncle gets up and grabs the shotgun, heads for the door, but realizes the scream isn't alone this time. Another voice chimes in, then another, to eventually form what he would later describe as a little chorus of suffering. He starts to back away slowly from the door, and that's when the chanting started. Listening to him tell the story, you'd almost start laughing at this point, unless you were really looking on him, because he was dead serious, and full of all those little micro-expressions that happen as you really recall something. He could hear their footsteps creak up and down the small wooden porch of the cabin, the chanting from multiple voices, multiple footsteps. By this time, him and his girlfriend are in a shadow in the corner of the cabin, away from the windows and the light of the fireplace, shotgun leveled at the door. He says it felt like forever, animals screaming, them chanting, him shaking, girlfriend crying. In hindsight, it must have only been 30 minutes or so. Then it all stopped. Not all at once, though. One by one, the barking stopped. One by one, the screams stopped. Until the last one, with which the footsteps and chanting came to an end. My uncle sat huddled in the corner, though, for several hours. Eventually, the sky started to brighten with that morning blue against the silhouette of the pines. He waited a while longer until the sun crept over the mountain range before making his way to the window. He had an idea of what he'd see. He'd hunted big game and small game, but this was different. The porch was empty, but the cabin ground weren't. He peeked his shotgun out the front door, slowly opened it. There in the morning sun, a nice cool morning, he recalls, birds chirping, air fresh, the ground was strewn with dead animals. Blood everywhere, everything dead and dissected, guts and organs strewn about. He puked right there on the porch when the smell hit him. Regaining his composure, he made his way around the animals. An odd detail, he thought in retrospect, were the rubber bands tied around the testicles of some of them. He'd seen enough. Him and his girlfriend noped the F out. They made it to town, called the police and the owner. Not sure what came of it. He gets visibly shaken to this day just when it's mentioned. He says he thinks it was those skinwalkers, but he's a superstitious backwoods hick more or less. I live in Portland, Oregon, but I work at Mount Rainier National Park as a backcountry ranger. I would like to remain anonymous, so please refrain from including my name. On the night of the 5th of September 2015, I was driving home from work after a busy day of trail maintenance on the Ara Loop. I was about 15 miles east of Paradise at about 1.30 a.m., and I was doing about 50 miles per hour. I was driving on the Lewis River Road. It was a beautiful night, and I was enjoying the drive. I had my headlights on high beam and was watching my mirrors to avoid deer as they frequent this area, and in the past, I'd nearly totaled my car in the winter when a large buck jumped out. As I rendered the corner coming out of the forest, I noticed a large dark figure on the side of the road. Now immediately I'm on edge because in my mind, I'm imagining this being a large buck about to jump out from my car, and I could not afford the time to make another car payment. I immediately slam on my brakes because I wasn't sure what was going to happen, and I realized it was not a deer because this thing was standing beside a tree on the road's shoulder. So I slowed down even more. I began to focus what little eyesight I had on this creature, and I could see that it was very, very large, probably about eight feet tall, covered in shaggy long hair that looked very thick and matted. It was hard to tell in the lighting conditions and shadows any real details of the face, but I could tell that it turned to look at me directly and then stopped and stepped off the road into the field. It was obviously aware of my presence and did not seem surprised by me. 
They continued to walk away from the road into the field, lumbering on two legs. I'm telling you now it was not a bear because it never walked like one. It reminded me of a person on two legs the entire time, the comfortability of bipedally walking. It walked for about a minute, maybe a minute and a half, before I could not see it anymore. I was in shock, to say the least. I drove very slowly for a minute to see if maybe I could see it again, but I eventually lost sight of it. Even though I was in shock, I did not feel too scared. I did not feel threatened. I was just in total awe at what I just saw. It was so huge and very obviously not a bear or a person in a suit. Why would somebody be out here in the middle of nowhere? It also walked very naturally on two legs. I went back to the spot the next day and measured a tree it was standing beside. That's how I know it was around eight and a half feet tall. I've been a park ranger for the better half of eight years now and have never seen anything like this before in my life. I have had other interesting experiences though in the backcountry, but they were mostly while working and related to the environment. People are always throwing around the term Bigfoot, but I have no idea what this was. I'm ignorant. Please excuse me, and thank you for your time. If you can provide any information, that would be most helpful. Thank you again. May of 1985, we were dispatched to a rural area of Placer County, California, investigating some possible dog or livestock killings. The crime was that the owners found their dogs dead in the backyard and one of their goats was taken from the pen and killed, pulled apart like a piece of chicken. What was strange about this is that any animal abducting goats or hens would generally eat on them, not take their prey and pull them apart and leave the body. When we got there at first, we saw nothing, but when we began to walk around by our cars, we could hear something, something breathing pretty heavily, like it was running and getting closer. So we walked around some more and could see what looked like a little person hiding behind two trees, just about 50 yards out, looking at us. My partner actually recognized it at first, that it looked like a human face or maybe a child, but with glowing eyes, crouching down and covered in hair. Then it crouched down all fours and ran away into another tree. I was already shooting at it with my 9mm. It did not move like a human, but like that of an animal. That is when it came out of the tree and was on top of me. The rest of the incident is kind of blurry. However, I do know that nobody could find the bullet casings or even see what I had been firing my weapon. I then took them to where the creature was standing when it ran across the road. They still could find nothing. The people who worked on the case were stunned by what happened. One man said he would later go back there again if need be. He also claimed that he had been feeling something evil in the area for a while now. Take that as far as you want. Later on down the road, we also found some dead cattle in another part of the county. We were told by the owner that he had been having problems with some cattle mutilations and thought that this something that I had shot at was also killing his livestock. I know it was not the same thing because the killings were different. Another man who we spoke to had said that this goat that was killed had its stomach completely ripped open just like the others, left there to rot. My report and statement were only taken so far. With this creature having jumped on top of me, I'm surprised it did not kill me, but it did give me some pretty severe trauma that I have to live with. I can tell you that whatever this thing was, it was not a normal human or an animal. This was something else altogether may be an unknown species of some kind, something that science probably will deny. The brisk mountain air filled my lungs as I stepped off the charter bus and stood in front of the green forest of a Virginia nature park. I was here for a company retreat at an expensive cabin resort a few miles down the road. It all seemed like a bit much, but I was never one to turn down an extravagant gift. As one of the medical liaisons for the company, I was responsible for speaking with physicians about new drugs we had coming down the pipeline. I dabbled a bit in marketing as well to help bring focus to our more lucrative products. Though I'm still trying to get that added to my job description with a pay increase. 
I wasn't very passionate about it, to be honest. I was having my first life crisis as I approached 30. The light of fluorescent bulbs was a poor substitute for the sun, and looking out the windows of my office only served to torture me with prospects of the outside world. I wondered if staying in the office all day just to fly to other offices and convince doctors to buy the same drugs with a different patent and brand name was worth it. I was usually a complete homebody, however, once upon a time when I was a little girl you couldn't keep me inside. I spent the better part of my childhood and hormone-ridden teenage years exploring the woods and rivers near our house in the Pacific Northwest United States. Hell, I begged and pleaded with my parents until they allowed me to sign up for outdoor survival camps. I think it was sometime during college that a sudden bout with depression had killed that hobby of mine. The habits of staying inside on bright sunny days had entrenched itself into my leisure time. However, at the behest of my therapist, I decided to pick up hiking and running outside in nature as much as possible. I forgot how good the air felt in my lungs and the feeling of triumph when I ran just a little bit faster for a little bit longer that day. And while hiking I had taken to snapping pictures of wildlife with my iPhone. Even with my salary, I couldn't justify buying an expensive camera when the one in my pocket did well enough. I'll be back every two hours and the last pickup is at 7 p.m. If you need a ride after that you'll have to pay for someone from the hotel to come and get ya. The bus driver's gruff tones snapped me out of my haze. He gave me a lasting look for a moment. Make sure you mind the park rules. It's in yours and the park's best interest. I was a bit confused as he pulled off. I pushed it out of my mind and tied my braids into a short ponytail as I headed toward the visitor's center. It doubled as the command station for the park rangers and was a moderately big one-story building with large windows that ran from the side of the building facing the road to the large double doors in the front. As I entered, a welcome center greeted me to my right with an open circle of couches and a center table. Surrounded by a few smaller beat-up tables and chairs, and upon a long table with a leg propped up by old magazines sat an old coffee maker with cream cups and sugar. A woman with brown skin, dark freckles, and curly brown hair shoved under a ranger's hat leaned over and grabbed a map as I approached the greeter's desk. Hello, miss. She smiled. I assume you're here to enjoy our wonderful nature trails and take in some sun. Been looking forward to it as a matter of fact. I brimmed back and looked at the town maps and photos from across the decades. I kinda always wanted to slow down and live in a small town like this. It's not a bad town, actually. We're close enough to a city to not be a dust bowl, but it's pretty quiet outside tourist season. Y'all got here after the summer rush. Had to kick out a few visitors for causing some property damage, and uh, we're still looking for a couple of others. She solemnly avoided eye contact as she turned toward a sign on the wall. Well, we only have three rules here at the park. Absolutely, and under no circumstances are you to leave the trail now listen. No matter what you see or hear, do not disturb the bare carbons along the paths. If you haven't seen one in more than a quarter mile or roughly 20 minutes, or if you see any broken ones, then you turn back immediately. That was an odd way of putting it. No matter what I saw or heard, they seem to take forest preservation very seriously here. I nodded in acknowledgement. For sure, for sure. What about photography? I've kind of... Absolutely no photography once you've passed the fence post here. Her face grew stern and she looked me directly in the eyes as she circled a marker that was about a mile from the entrance. Also, and this is an unofficial rule, but you may have the opportunity to see black bears in the area. The same rules apply as the carvings. Leave him alone and no pictures. We can't risk having M chased off. Uh, thanks, I guess. See you in a bit then. I folded the map and put it in my pocket. The park closes at 7.45 p.m., so that gives you some time before sunset. I would not suggest being here at night. Rangers may not be able to find you. I nodded hesitantly and left the station toward the hiking trail until I came upon a small wooden booth next to a bulletin board. 
I was glancing at the papers put up for the day and quite a few were missing persons. It was always sad seeing these people. I thought maybe this is why they were so strict about the trail. Were the circumstances around the disappearances really so bad as to elicit such strict park rules? People like you end up on that board because they don't listen. I was startled by the gravelly and disgruntled voice of an older ranger, sporting a salt and pepper goatee. He had to tilt his head down slightly to look at me. I was briefed on the way here, thanks. I responded annoyed. You people never listen. I do everything I can to limit how many of you outsiders come here. They should just shut this damn place down. We already don't get enough funding. He stared off into the forest. But then... I didn't like the undercurrent of superiority that dripped off his tone. I'm fully capable of taking care of myself. I stated as I firmly pushed past him. The ranger was silent as I hastily jogged down the path. I noticed the waist-high bear carvings mentioned by the woman in the ranger station. The surrounding forest gave me chills as I made my way down the twisting trail. I couldn't argue with the park's inherent beauty that dispelled my uneasiness. I approached the first one-mile marker and took it all in. After a few moments I looked upon a split path, the trail on the right flat, even, and covered in footprints from visitors. The higher gradient laid to the left. Well, I do like to get a workout. I thought to myself. Plus, there was likely to be more wildlife on the path less traveled. Maybe I could sneak a few shots in. A few minutes up the path and the sun was beginning to lift my mood despite the heat of the rays bearing down. I began to feel that all too familiar high from being outdoors again. Well, hello there. I was startled and looked over to my right. Behind the tree line, their backs to the forest, stood a man and his wife wearing disturbingly wide smiles. He stood upright while she had her arm around his waist, both sported matching blue tank tops. Everything below the husband's waist was obscured by foliage. They kind of looked familiar, but something was off. Like she was holding on to him to keep herself from falling. Maybe she was just tired or injured. Nice day for it, isn't it? He gleamed. His wife still silent beside him, her smile not faltering an inch. Ah, yea, it truly is a beautiful park. I haven't seen any wildlife in this area yet. I assumed there'd be quite a few here, hoping for at least a black bear. I looked further up the trail, but from the corner of my eye, I saw the man's smile twitch ever so slightly. Ah, yea, dear. I think they're just afraid of the trail cause of the people. Sun's really barren down today. His wife finally spoke, but who the hell spoke like that? The sentences barely flowed together like a badly cut remix or post-mortem album. We saw some deer just behind us when we left the trail. We can show you. The wife nodded in a gesture behind them. I took a step forward then froze. A faint rancid smell wafted through the air and a sense of malice, directed toward me, came from deeper in the woods. Every part of my brain screamed at me to run. That's, that's fine. We're supposed to stay on the trail anyway, and I don't want to upset the park rangers any more than I have. Don't be ridiculous, said the man in a strained, almost staticky voice, still smiling. Shouldn't his cheeks be hurting by now? Just come on through can't see the good stuff if you stick to the rules. I'm fine, really. Maybe I'll see something up ahead, but I need to keep my heart rate going. Good line, Ina, really using those sales tactics. I do deserve a raise. The man's smile twitched again. Okay, he said slowly. Without another word, he and his wife took off deeper into the woods. The gait of their walk was weird, too, as if they were tied together in a three-legged race. Maybe she sprained her ankle, but by the time I thought to call after them, they were gone. I continued up the trail for another twenty minutes, and the trees had receded a bit, giving room for nice grassy areas to relax in. As I thought to cross the threshold kept by the wooden bear beside the trail, I heard a strange noise. Was that? Was that something whimpering? I looked to the other side of the trail and lo and behold, a foot behind the other bear carving was a red fox laying on its side, one of its back legs completely twisted around. 
Oh no, you poor thing. What happened? The fox looked at me with vaguely human eyes and continued to whimper and pull itself toward the woods. The poor thing was so scared. It whimpered and barked and yipped. Chirp, chirp, and chirped to pull at my heart's dry. Wait. It sounded like a child doing their best impression, but I know I heard it. I stopped just before I was fully in the grassy patch, my back foot still in line with the bear carving. The fox froze and stared at me from the corner of its eye. As I started to back away, it turned toward me with a horrifying scowl. It rolled over onto its belly and slithered, crawled away. Its limbs moved, but slightly out of sync with one another. Its broken leg no longer an issue. Now that I think about it, it was more like a puppeteer trying to mimic walking while dragging it deeper into the woods. Crunch. Snap. Crunch. The distinctive sound of footsteps making their way through the forest. Was it the couple from earlier? I thought they had gone a different direction into the woods. Were they following me? I took off into a jog, but as I continued to hear the footsteps around me, I began to run. The sound of snapped branches and broken leaves came closer and closer. I began to sprint, but no matter how fast I ran, the footsteps were right behind me. It must be them. The timing matched that weird walk I noticed before, but how would they be able to keep up with me like this? Fancy seeing you again. I pressed on the balls of my feet, stopping so hard I nearly fell over. The rancid smell began to fill my nostrils. In the trees right before the left path and a fork in the road, leaning a hand on a broken bear carving was the couple. Their front unobscured. It was like someone had shoved the bottom half of the wife through the husband's torso and melded them together. She hung forward on her husband's left side and held herself upright on a broken bear carving. Three legs supported them, the center a peg of twisted and gnarled flesh broken off at the ankle. Something had clearly misunderstood the architecture of the human body. We didn't think we'd ka 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 catch up to ya, choked out the wife. We thought we might, I heard someone call. I'm so cold. It hurts, and wanted to make sure you was all right. Safe, dear. It's just not safe. Keep run running safe in the forest. The husband stuttered out, once again mimicking random lines from a tape recorder. The smell grew stronger, and I could feel that menacing presence on the trails to my left and right. It was all an encompassing and suffocating darkness that corrupted the soil, the animals, and the very air itself. I needed to get away. I needed to run to the only place I couldn't feel a sense of dread. And before I knew it, I had taken off straight down the middle of the fork into the woods. Faster and faster I ran, hearing the clumsy clambering of the coupled monstrosity behind me. I felt the cutting air of hands that barely missed the nape of my neck as I ran. I attempted to cut perpendicular to the straight path I had been running, hoping I would run into another path again. The footsteps behind me began to grow distant and my lungs were on fire. I ducked behind a large rock and tree, trying to quiet my exasperated breaths. Are you okay, miss? An echoey voice called out ahead of me. A man stood in a ranger's uniform, this head hidden underneath his hat. Come here, miss away from the forest, not safe. I didn't notice the jerky extension of his hand as he beckoned me toward him. Neither did I notice the return of the rancid smell that had stalked me earlier. I just wanted so badly to believe I was safe. I started to stand up and walk toward him, but he lifted his head and all that was there was a shifting dark void of tendrils inside a cavity where the man's face had once been. Watch out, ma'am, get back. Gunshots rang out from the void. Still, hungry, bored, with this one, you are desired. A croaky whisper emanated through my head. I fell back into a sitting position and held my head in my hands. The entity stepped toward me with an abysmal purpose, its hand extended, jerking back and forth at the wrist. Darkness enclosed around me and my vision blurred. Everything was getting so cold. There was a deep roar in the distance, an intimidating and hungry roar that grew louder as it approached. Oh God, what the hell is going to happen now, I thought. 
I must be in the maw of the beast, my insides soon to be devoured. I'll just be a hollow husk. But then nothing happened. I sat for a few seconds as a roar sped past me and a wet nose sniffed at my face. I opened my eyes to a black bear, large and drooling, inhaling me deeply before chuffing and chasing off after two other bears further into the woods. I forced myself up, my legs still a bit stiff with fear, and tried my best to orient myself back the way I came. I quickly built up to a run, following the specks of orange sunlight that grew more frequent the further I went. I might be closing back onto the trail I ran from earlier and relief began to wash over my body. Hey friend, fancy seeing you again. Hey, you stalking us? To my left, effortlessly galloping along, was the couple. Dark tendrils had burst through every orifice in their face, snaking and grasping at the air. Their faces were still twisted into smiles that now hung loosely from broken jaws. The wife bobbed to and fro, grabbing nearby trees to pull themselves closer to me. They started to scream in agony, begging for mercy. Their last words played back at wildly varying tempos. I began to see the trail again and the distinct outline of a wooden bear. I could do this, I told myself. Just run a little faster, just a little faster, just... Jump. Thwack. I landed hard. I looked forward to my fingers that fell just short of the trail. Then there was the sound of a person being tackled followed by a vicious roar. A few feet from me an old scar-ridden bear had put all his weight on the couple. The flayed trees to the side of me indicated he had charged in perpendicular to us. Two adolescent black bears had their jaws around the couple's neck and face. One bit down, cracking the face and skull like an egg and began tearing at the dark tendrils inside. The other tore their head off entirely and tore at the darkness like crab legs. They were eating them. The old bear sniffed in my direction, inhaling deeply as the bear deeper in the woods had. Disappointed, he turned his attention back to their kill and began to work his way through the torso. I thanked every god and spirit for the hungry animal that saved me. The sun was setting by the time I had emerged, and night had blanketed the sky as the ranger booth came into view almost an hour later. The park ranger I met on the way in stood with three others, including the head ranger who accosted me earlier at the notice board. Prick. Son of a bitch. There she is. The old ranger walked briskly over to me. The young ranger from inside the station had her shotgun raised. Put that damn thing down, Rita. If that thing was inside her, she wouldn't have made it past the carvings. He glanced over to the wooded area that snaked with a path behind me. Besides, she ain't gibbering at us from a meat suit. Shell, actually. They're more like... hard shells. I huffed out as we passed the notice board, and I saw the familiar missing photos of a middle-aged couple in matching blue tank tops. Beside them was the photo of a young park ranger, leaning on a wooden bear and smiling. Once inside the station, they sat me down on a couch and brought out a blanket before giving me a bowl of leftover chili from upstairs and a Gatorade. I poked around at the chili in between small bites. My mind was still trying to wrap itself around the events of the day. The head park ranger sat next to me, his hat in his hands, the thinning hair on his head turning gray. I lost my protege to that thing. Kid had his whole life in front of him, and he wouldn't listen to reason. He knew. I mean, he just knew that he had heard them calling from the woods. He sat up a little bit straighter. He never believed me much, and that's fair. Most people here don't believe until they see a deer standing upright, a bird bobbing up and down in the sky like a Gotham cartoon reel, but Gotham it. He choked back tears and rubbed his temple. Nobody was ever stupid enough to actually go in on their own. You could just feel something was wrong, but you. He pointed at me. You've seen it, you've survived its tricks, and you didn't do anything to hurt it, but you goddamn survived it. He rose to his feet and put his ranger hat back on. I stared out the window for a moment, still in shock of what happened, but the sheriff's point about survival struck a chord in me. I learned a lot today about how parks work, and I suspect you might have an opening. 
The old ranger looked at me quizzically before a slight smile crossed his face. The position wouldn't be super fancy, but I imagine it would allow someone to slow down a bit if they were interested. Help us get what we need to keep the people safe and certain wildlife confined. And that's it. That's how I came to live my small town dreams as a park ranger in Virginia. I took over marketing and after a couple of rangers said they'd started seeing more cubs further up the trail, I've pushed the idea of us being a black bear sanctuary. As such, the public was encouraged to stay on the trail for a clear and conscious reason instead of a vague horror movie warning. We've raised a lot more money this way as well. We repaired the broken bear carvings on the trail I was on just a couple years earlier. We have no idea who made them or where they come from, but we've tried recreating them with varying results. It's just a hunch, but I think that thing can't tell the difference between a fake one and a real one if it's carved just right. The current world situation has really given us the time to get our ducks in a row and sure up any safety holes as people were stuck at home. However, our state has declared that it is opening up again soon and people are antsy. This town saw its fair share of tourism before, but other parks in the U.S. have reported waves of visitors in numbers they haven't seen in a while. People are hauling their families and friends anywhere that isn't home, and this is a problem. We are going to lose people, but I don't believe that number has to be significant. So why did I tell you all of this? Is it to warn you against going to national parks? No, I fully believe you should patronize them as much as possible. We need the funds. But I am saying that the world out there holds horrors you couldn't imagine. Hell, from what I've heard from rangers at other parks, everyone has their own. Problems they have to handle. All unique in their own way. So please, come out and enjoy yourselves. Just abide by park rules. Oh yay, and please stop by the gift shop on your way out. All proceeds go to the park's office of operations and donations are always welcome. Ask for Nina in marketing and project management for more details on how you can help. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.